Welcome everybody, my name is Alex Cassano. I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society. Today I want to welcome Cleet uh, from the Tampa Bay History Center. He'll be presenting about the history of McDill Air Force Base. But before we get started with that, I just want to let you know some uh, upcoming events and exhibitions we're having at the museum here. Uh, first, on June 1st, our exhibit, our new exhibit about uh, founding families um, will be opening to the public. It's about different Clearwater history uh, families uh, that, and pioneers that made a difference and impact of the history of Clearwater. Uh, our next speaker series event is July 16th. We'll be having the Tampa Union Station. They'll be coming on, at 10 a.m. on Saturday, July 16th. Then after that, on July 30th, we have the Francis Wilson Playhouse Theater, which is a Broadway uh, production um, theater located uh, in Clearwater here. And then on August 6th, we have the Tampa Theater. Um, they're coming to tell about the historic uh, movie house that uh, graces uh, Tampa, downtown Tampa. Um, then uh, on September 17th, we have our South Ward School Day, which pays homage to the old South Ward Elementary School, which uh, is now the Clearwater Historical Society. We have a celebration to commemorate the school. And also that day we'll be having uh, the museums from around Pinellas County and Tampa Bay come and represent their museums. It's called the Tampa Bay Museum Expo. And these events on September 17th is from 10 to 2, um, so please come to that. And then on October 1st, we have a program about Florida gardening. And then also on October 1st, we have at 11.30, the history of the Manatee Agricultural Museum. And then on October 29th at 10 a.m., we're having the Marine Arts Center. And then November 5th, we're having our Fall Family Fun Day and general meeting um, from 10 to 2 here at our museum. Um, also, uh, to conclude the year, we have um, the Manatee um, Historical Village coming uh, to tell about their history as well. So if you want to receive updates or want to receive the schedule, please go on our Facebook page and, and website and check it out. So welcome to Get organized here for a minute. So it's a, a pleasure to be here today, and uh, Alex, thank you for inviting me and, and the Tampa Bay History Center where I am a docent, and uh, pleasure to talk about McDill where I was volunteering before the pandemic once a week, and I am a retired Air Force type, so uh, I uh, have a soft spot for McDill, stationed there too at one time. So. Um, as you can uh, imagine, McDill has brought a lot of changes. So the genesis of the base is something called the, uh, the National uh, Defense Act uh, of 1935, and it goes by the name of the congressman who introduced that, and his name is Wilcox. And at this time, even in 1935, the war clouds were gathering. And so the Congress thought that uh, there ought to be about seven strategic air bases throughout the country, and that as soon as they got the money, they wanted to start building those. So the um, Arcadia, the little town of Arcadia, made a, a big play to get to get the, the base, the one that would be in Florida, and the city of Tampa and the county just stayed sound asleep on it. And so at one point, uh, someone from the War Department came to the city fathers in Tampa and said, what's going on? You know, Arcadia has this bid in, and, then, and uh, it's a good, a good proposal, but recall that about a year ago we had some war games, and Tampa was a fictitious site of a base, didn't exist, uh, that was involved in the defense of Latin America and the Panama Canal. So 
So with that hint, it was so strong a hint, it was almost more like being struck with a two by four on the yeah. side of the head. Uh, Tampa got their act together and they made a proposal. And uh, the proposal was for what was called Catfish Point. And before I show you what Catfish Point, unfortunately, we don't have a big enough projection here. But these are some of the semi-squatters that were living down in that area at the tip of the peninsula, the Interbay Peninsula. And they look like characters out of the movie Deliverance, if you've seen that. I would not want to be the person that's going to go tell those people that they're going to have to move. Were they, were they white people? Yeah. Were they white people? Yes. Yes, but they were. One of them in that picture, it looks like he's holding a rifle, so that would scare me away. So, here's the Interbay Peninsula, if you're not familiar with it. And uh, it's sort of hanging down from the... Uh, the port that's the city of Tampa up at the top of, of Hillsborough Bay there, it says Tampa, Florida. That's where the main part of the city is. But then you have this long peninsula hanging down. And Catfish Point is would be that little projection of land under the letter A where it says McPhill on that, on that particular map. And then you see the three bridges going across Tampa Bay over to Pinellas County. So uh, right away, you can imagine the advantages that this location had. Uh, you're not going to be crashing planes in too many neighborhoods, or, or are likely in the water, as a matter of fact. So it was a good location, and lo and behold, Tampa got, got the prize, won the prize, and their nomination uh, prevailed. So the feds condemned the land in the summer of 1939, and what did they get? Well, they got 6,000 acres of what most people affectionately call Florida brush. It was palmettos and scrub pines and scrub oaks, things of that sort. A lot of sand, a lot of marsh, and also a lot of snakes. So what do you do with the snakes? Well, there was a town not that far north of the base, uh, if you're familiar with Gandy Boulevard and West Shore, and you're almost approaching the Gandy Bridge, there was an incorporated town there called Rattlesnake, Florida. So obviously it was a good place to find rattlesnakes, right? And this place sported a post office. You see the picture there of the post office. And uh, it also had a cannery. They were canning rattlesnake meat. And it also had a tourist attraction because you could go there and watch the owner uh, by the name of George End uh, periodically milk the venoms for the snake, which would then be fought into medical labs to produce anti-venom drugs. So it was a going concern. Uh, the meat was shipped all over the country, uh, the canned meat. And you'll recall, because you're all historians, that uh, during the Depression, you had the WPA, right? And the w, one of their major projects was to, it was called the Writer's Project. And they would uh, task different people to go around the community in their areas and find things to write about. And so we have uh, a, a report from one of those uh, writers back then about uh, rattlesnake canneries, right? And it says, among other things, um, the delicacy resembles chicken a la king in looks and taste, but with a flavor all its own. Why does everything taste like chicken? Right? <laughs> but anyway, um, it says, um, so it, uh, in addition to the canned product, part of the catch consisting of choice bits of meat are hickory smoked and marketed in small flakes called snake snacks, put up in cellophane bags. So you could buy those locally. And here's where you come in. Uh, these taste very much like smoked herring and are good served with beer, wine, cocktails, or other beverages. <laughs> Next time you have people over, <laughs> you don't have to search for a menu. And the venom is extracted for snakes and used by scientists all, all over the place, along with other things for the skins and so on. So an interesting, uh, uh, and you see George Henn at the picture to the right. He's fetching a rattlesnake. Some of those snakes would weigh as much as 15 pounds. And uh, unfortunately, George died at the, at the hands or fangs of a rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. 
I guess they were low on anti-venom series at that time. So anyway, uh, they got underway and they, they really did an amazing job of converting that property to an airfield. And that picture is uh, in the 1940s and it's under construction there. You see the runways, some of the barracks there, and, uh, and then we go to another picture and this is a picture of the, uh, the first hospital area there. And that, if you're familiar at all with the bases, down at the very bottom of the peninsula where the marina is now in the family camp. And it's constructed in the typical military hospital fashion there, where a bunch of barracks-like buildings, all connected by breezeways, that generally just had screen closures on either side of the breezeway. So the operative word was breeze. And if you were taking a physical or something in one of those hospitals, you ran from one of those buildings to the other as you had to go from one place to the next as you're part of your physical. Oftentimes in your skivvies, so it was not comfortable. The breezeways breeze are really very breezy. And let's see, here is beginning to look like a base. Uh, that's probably the main sort of east-west road going down toward the uh, hangars. And uh, you can see some of the hangars in the background there that are still under construction. But they formally dedicated the base in April of 1941. And they named it MacDill. Now the story is told that they wanted to name it Dale Mabry. And Alex's dad was telling me about uh, Dale Mabry up in Tallahassee. And, uh, but Tallahassee didn't want to give up the name because they are already had a, uh, an Army airfield in Tallahassee called Dale Mabry Army. So they would have had to switch with MacDill and they didn't want to do that. So the base got named uh, MacDill after an aviator who got killed in a crash in 1938. And he was a, what in the Air Force would be described as a fast Burma. He was going up the ranks very quickly, very well thought of. He, he uh, obtained the first uh, doctor's degree in aeronautical engineering at MIT. So he obviously was, was a pretty bright guy. So the first plane to land was piloted by uh, the new base commander, who was Colonel Clarence Tinker. Now Tinker is an interesting character too. He uh, was a Native American, Osage Indian, and he actually eventually reached the rank of Major General, the highest ranking Native American in the uh, war at that point. That was Clarence Tinker, very well thought of um, in the Tampa Bay area, including Clearwater and uh, St. Pete, because he was an avid fisherman. Well, then it happened. Uh, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, and we were in World War II, in which 405,000 Americans would die in combat. Uh, how do you suppose Tinker maybe found out that we were at war? You think he got a call on his cell phone? <laughs> not, not in a minute. So let's digress for just a second. If you've been in Tampa for very long, you would remember this guy. This is a guy called Saul Fleischman. You some do remember him. He was a character too. And he was a sports writer. He, he, uh, and he, he worked for WDAE radio uh, for much of the time television was either not existing or just coming on online. Then he worked for WTVT and the Tampa Bay Times, and he was an avid fisherman. So he gave the, the fishing report and uh, put just a real character. And he was a big buddy of General Tinker. So he would broadcast on uh, uh, the radio from the top floor of the Tampa Terrace Hotel. And so on uh, December 7th, he's up there playing records and calls down to the uh, restaurant. He says, make me a sandwich, I'll be down a little bit to pick it up. And all of a sudden his feed is interrupted by CBS and it says, there uh, we have a report of, of planes with red markings uh, bombing in Hawaii. And his reaction was another exercise. They exercise it all the time, nothing nothing to really be worried about. So 
So then he goes downstairs to get a sandwich, and General Tinker happens to be having lunch. And he says, uh, what's up? Tinker asked him that, and he said, well, uh, there's something on the radio about planes with red markings uh, bombing in Hawaii. <laughs> and of course, Tinker jumps out of the chair, just about turns everything over. <laughs> says, we're at war, and runs out, jumps in his car. But uh, good old song. So here we have uh, essentially, uh, hopefully, there it is, a picture of a uh, B-17. Because MacDill became a training base for bomber crews. And so here's a B-17 heavy bomber. That was the first one to be uh, used for training. And uh, it had a crew of, of nine people on board. That's a lot of people huh? on one airplane. And uh, the B-17s did the brunt of daylight bombing in Europe, uh, particularly in Japan and Italy. Um, and as an example, the 91st Bombardment uh, Group formed at, at MacDill flew 9,571 combat missions from 1942 to 1945, and they lost 197 airplanes. They had 1,010 airmen were killed, and about uh, 960 became prisoners of war. And unfortunately, General Tinker at that point was in the Pacific as the new commander of 7th Air Force there. And uh, the Battle of Mid Midway was taking place, and his plane went down at uh, at, uh, during that battle, anyway, he was leading a, an attack. And Tinker was of, of the Osage Indian philosophy that the leader of a group of warriors is going to be at the front of the warriors, not behind him. So yeah. that's why he was there. He unfortunately lost his life. So the second plane to have training, and this was in the 1942. Uh, was the B-26 Marauder. Now, it had a crew of six, but this plane was terribly hard to fly. If you can see it there, you see it only has two engines for one thing, but they were gigantic engines, but it also had very short wings. So that required a very high speed takeoffs and landings, which isn't good if you only have two engines and you're learning how to fly, fly the airplane, right? So, this plane, though, was, was designed by Martin Aircraft Company. And they designed it, and right off the drawing board, they started building it. No prototypes, no wind tunnel tests, none of those other things. So it was right from the drawing board to the flight line. And uh, the problem was what they call a high, lit, a high wing load factor. And I have a couple of models that the History Center has spent a lot of money on to develop these models, right? So I'll tell you what a, a high wing load model, uh, load factor is. And it's simply the area of the wing is divided into the overall area of the airplane. So if you have the same amount of thrust and you have real big wings like this, right? Well, look at that. It takes a while to land and a nice soft landing. That could be a uh, C-130 aircraft, or maybe even a, uh, a U-2, because the U-2, while a narrow fuselage, had huge wings. When it would take off, they actually had like bicycle struts under the ends of the wings that would drop off as it took off, because the wings were so big. Well, here's an RS-71. Now, this was the fastest airplane ever, ever built, no longer in the service. But this is probably pretty close to how it looked. Very streamlined, very fast. And we see the same amount of thrust. You see what happens to that. So it has a very high wing load factor. Uh, as a result, in one month almost alone, they lost 31 airplanes in, in and around the bay. And that developed for MacDill a very unfortunate slogan, which MacDill did not appreciate. And that was, one a day in Tampa Bay. Oh, no. <laughs> Kind of catchy, but <laughs> uh, so the the morale of the of the trainees was so bad at that point they wanted out, and they brought in General Jimmy Doolittle, who was back from his very successful raid on Tokyo, taking off bombers from an aircraft carrier, 
and uh, and he talked to the to the uh, pilot trainees, and essentially he said, "Look, it's a very difficult plane to fly, but once you learn how to fly it, you're going to like it. It's going to be good. So just learn how to fly it." And that was kind of tough love, right? And then they also though, brought in a, a lady by the name of Jackie Cochran, and she was the founder of the Women's Air Service Pilots. And this group, all not active military, they're about the next best thing to it. They would send these women pilots to all these different aircraft manufacturing places. And as those planes flew out, came out the assembly line, these women would fly them to the base that that particular plane was going to be stationed at. So they performed a really vital task. And Jackie Cochran, she was a tough lady. But I think uh, she said, look, you're, you're going to learn how to fly the plane. I fly it all the time, and it's not really that bad. So I guess it worked, and they stuck with the program, and, and uh, eventually uh, the plane got used as a, first they tried it as a low-level bomber. Uh, but once again, that didn't work real well. They tried it in Holland, and it got decimated initially, because with just such short, small wings, it couldn't sustain any flak damage very long. A B-17, you've probably seen pictures of some of those that came back all the way to England, and even the tail is shot off. You know. So they would, they would be... <coughs> so anyway, here's a picture of... Um, let's see, what do we got here? Yeah, there's a picture of the uh, rescue boats out in the water. They, uh, it became, they became known as uh, McDill's Navy. And they were standing by to go rescue any crew members uh, out of the drink that they could. So, now looking at this montage of, of gunnery training, the first thing that occurs to you is it's very basic, not high tech. You can see there's a, one guy has a, uh, a model airplane on a stick out here that you're shooting at, and the uh, other one over here looks more like a set of wash tubs than, than the... Uh, capsules for the gunnery. And so it was very basic. And the other thing that, that hit me when I first saw that picture was that uh, they looked like little boys. And of course, that's precisely what they were. Now, McDill also trained some support units. Um, this is an interesting one. The Engineer Aviation Battalions. Uh, these were um, all African-American uh, troops uh, that made up these uh, aviation battalions, or at least these particular ones. So obviously back then, at the Port Tampa end of the base, that was called a colored base, and that's where all the colored troops lived. And most of them were training in this, uh, to be in these uh, engineer aviation battalions. And they were very much involved in runway construction and heavy equipment operation, things of that sort. And locally, they prepared Mullet Key as the primary target uh, site for the bombing and, and gunnery training. And uh, they were among the first to deploy to the Pacific, because you'll recall that, that the technique in the Pacific was to keep seizing more and more islands from the Japanese to get closer and closer to Japan that would then put it in range of our bombers. So they were involved in, in that, and they were uh, among the first uh, to go to the South Pacific. And then here's another group, uh, the uh, Women's Army Corps. Uh, they came in uh, 1943, the first contingent, and you can see them disembarking there from the buses, and that was probably a pretty pretty exciting day at McDill, one was supposed. Uh, they lived in regular army barracks, and they were subject to standard military customs and courtesies. And they trained for administrative duties and photo lab duties, too. After uh, a bit, uh, the base went back to training B-17 crews again for the duration of the war. Now, what about off base? Well. Uh, some interesting things here. Some 20,000 individuals just from Hillsborough County had left the area to be in the service or work in defense industries and other places. 
I'm sure Pinellas was the same situation. So, what are you going to do for manpower? Well, oftentimes manpower became woman power. And so, you see uh, them filling the void in, in jobs that were never thought of before as jobs for, for women. And this first one you see is a, called Joan of Arc. And you'll recall that you've heard of Rosie the Riveter out, we, out west in the uh, California and the aircraft companies there. Uh, well, Rosie, the, uh, I'm sorry, Joan of Arc was an arc welder and a lot of other women too, because generally speaking, they would fit into little tight spaces that the guys might not be able to. But the example I like, I wish I had a slide of this, but is the Zaccini family. I'll tell you about the Zaccini family. They were a circus family, and their roots go back to the 1920s in performing all over Europe. I think there were maybe native Yugoslavia or some of those Eastern European areas there. And their act, which I saw as a little boy, was called the uh, uh, Human Cannonball. Uh, and it was so popular that, that they say that people would be standing in line to go to the circus and ask, well, are they going to be performing? If the answer was no, they said, well, we'll come back early to perform. Mm -hmm. So they were good. And the way it worked is they had two, two of these, but this huge cannon was based on the bed of a truck, a flatbed truck. And then the muzzle went over the top, the back end of the cab, pointing up. So it's quite a, a huge muzzle on this thing. And um, at one point then, uh, the band at the circus would play very exciting music and everybody was excited. And then I would come, uh, the person that was the human cannonball, and be dressed in a, a white leather flight suit with a helmet and everything, and then climb up a series of ladders and then insert himself down into the cannon. And then the music would get even more loud and, and exciting, and then kaboom, and all the smoke would come out. And this individual would fly through the air almost 100 yards and land in a net. Quite a, quite a net. And I, it would, obviously it impressed me. So anyway, um, the two sons in the family were the cannonballs, but they were away in the war. So what are we going to do? Well, they turned to a girl by the name of A. Lee Zaccini, the daughter. She was a senior at Plant High School, and she became the human cannonball. <laughs> so once again, Tampa has a set a record, right? First <laughs> female human cannonball. Well, anyway, the uh, peace came at last. Uh, September 2nd, 1945, and uh, happened you surrendered, uh, brought about in large measure by the atomic bombing of a couple of cities there, Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Now this was a B-29, and uh, you see the, uh, the commander of that, that airplane was Colonel Paul Tibbetts who had, later after the war became the uh, sixth air division commander at MacDill for a number of years. But anyway, uh, does anybody know uh, how the plane got that name, uh, Enola Gay? His mother. Hmm? His mother. Say again? His mother. His mother, exactly. <laughs> that was Tippett's mom's name. So uh, if you uh, look at some of those bullets on the slide, it kind of summarizes, it says that up to 100,000 crew members were trained at MacDill during the war, and 15,000 people on the base at any one time. And uh, interestingly enough, 488 German prisoners of war uh, worked on the base, as they did on many of the bases in Florida, and probably here in Pinellas too, uh, doing jobs like motor pool and stuff like that. But um, very... Uh, very important function there. Huh? So that uh, sort of wraps up the story about World War II. And in, uh, after, the, uh, after the war, and then 75 years or more have gone by now. So MacDill has done lots of different things in that, in that time frame. Uh, gentlemen had come in earlier, but had to go to the 
another being or whatever, was saying that the, the strike command was there when, when he was there. And uh, that's, that was a unified command. So they broke new ground by having these unified commands. And strike command sort of evolved into readiness command and, uh, and then that evolved into U.S. Central Command. So anyway, the story of the base, so after the war then, was uh, still a training base, first for, for B-29 bombers, like uh, Tibbetts used. And then it, then it evolved into jets, B-47 jets. They had about 100 of these airplanes. Those are pretty good sized planes. So you can imagine the noise that that created around the area. So fortunately, only the people on the north side had to deal with that and not many of the approaches were done over those neighborhoods. Um, then uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred, and they took all the bombers out, and they stacked all of these fighter airplanes. That time they were thinking they are going to go into Cuba and support the operations there in Cuba. But they were ready to go. They all had their targets, and uh, all set to go. Fortunately, that never happened. Well, after that, uh, the base became a training base for fighters. Uh, the uh, F-16, the F-4, these are famous airplanes that trained at MacDill. And in fact, at one point, and, there, and a lot of countries still fly the F-16, uh, more than half those pilots were trained at MacDill. So it was a big operation, about 100 of those planes and 100. So uh, it's been uh, still uh, obviously a very much Air Force base, but the thing that probably saved its life was the Central Command, U.S. Central Command. Because in the 90s, MacDill got put on a list of bases that should be considered to be closed. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, Pinellas had a congressman by the name of, who was your famous congressman? Bill Young. What was it? Bill, Bill Young. Young. So, Bill Young. Bill Young, yes. Bill Young and Sam mm -hmm. Gibbon. But I think Bill, Bill Young was really out front <coughs> in lobbying to maintain the base. And so whatever, whatever happened, happened and worked well for McDill and didn't get it. But most people think of Central Command, and by then Special Operations, Unified Special Operations, was at McDill. So those are two good reasons to leave it open. Now it's a primary uh, Air Force function there on refueling. And the, the uh, sixth air mobility uh, wing is the one that's at the top of that uh, list there of what's happening at the uh, base now. Interestingly enough, its patch bears the image of a sailboat going through this pass, rocky pass. That's uh, symbolic of the Panama Canal. And the unit that the sixth air mobility wing descends from, if you genealogist we would trace it back to a unit that was at the uh, Panama Canal Zone flying reconnaissance flights, which explains the little airplane up there. So anyway, the 60 Air Mobility Wing becomes the host unit for everybody else. So there's another uh, refueling wing, a reserve refueling wing there. So lots of refuelers, and they go everywhere in the world. And then there's U.S. Central Command and U.S. Special Operations Command. And all of these different things I'm showing you receive logistical support from the 6th Air Mobility Wing as a host unit. The commander of that unit is like the mayor of a city. But they don't provide any mission support, just logistical support to these other folks. Here's a joint communication support element. That's a little known operation I associated with the Jonestown Massacre. Remember the Jonestown Massacre? Mm -hmm. Where these people got convinced that they should commit suicide down in the whole country? Yes. And so, uh, unfortunately, uh, this unit, the first one's down there. And they go everywhere in the world, uh, in places you don't want to go. Because generally, they don't have good communications. But I always remember that those guys went, went there. Uh, and then there's an Army Reserve aviator support, aviation support on facility that's just opening, and I think that they're coming out of uh, Clearwater, out of the St. Pete Clearwater. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there a helicopter unit? Uh, I think it was. But it's got like 50 helicopters, uh, so it's, it's going to add a lot of noise to it. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's another 30 other tenant, smaller tenant organizations. So it's a busy, busy place. And the mayor, and the, like I say, the commander is almost like the mayor of a small city. Uh, the base brings in about $14 billion a year to the economy in the, in the whole Bay Area. So it's very important in, in that respect, too. But uh, over the years, it's also brought in a consistent flow of people from other places, diverse backgrounds, diverse uh, ethnicity or whatever, you name it, they brought it here at MacDill. In fact, this number sticks in my mind, too. It's almost as bad as the Zaccini family. But in the first year, operational year of the base, 1942, uh, 2,200 airmen married local ladies. And, uh, <laughs> that was just in 1942. <laughs> so obviously, bringing in people from all these other places. And of course, it's continued to do that over the years. Uh, so uh, it's very uh, important. And that sort of reminds me, too, of the of how the immigrants in the late 1800s, early 1900s, in the cigar industry came in and certainly changed the whole flavor of, of Tampa and the whole area. Um, so that kind of wraps it up. I'm happy to talk about some questions, but let me just conclude by showing you that's a slide of the History Center. And it's right by the Amelie Arena. It's right on the river wall. And like I was suggesting earlier, be a great field trip for your group to uh, come there sometime as a group. It has a branch of the Columbia restaurant in the atrium. It's got a nice cafe, nice little menu too, and uh, just very nicely located there. And you would enjoy all aspects of it, uh, galleries on the cigar industry and war stories that we go into more details and uh, that uniform. Uh, I think that kind of wraps up my portion.